Hi, all. These are generally conversations between adults after the children have left the table. The language can be spicy, and the subjects can get saucy. So if you're ready, this is the Southern Fork. Unscripted kitchen chats, and also studio chats, with some of the most interesting voices in the culinary South. I'm Stephanie Burt, a food and beverage writer who travels with her fork to write for a variety of publications, from magazines you might have on your coffee table to the website you love to visit for your favorite recipes. And I'm inviting you to come behind the scenes with me to get to know the people who make this Southern culinary landscape so special. I'm always hungry for the next bite, thirsty for that next sip, and ready for the next conversation. Let's dig in. The Southern Fork is proud to say that once again, the presenting sponsor for Season 8 is Townsend Automotive in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. First off, thanks to so many of you listeners out there who not only decided to purchase a vehicle from this family-owned business in the last two years, but also shared with them that it was directly because of their support of this show. That's what community even in our virtual format, is all about. Second, Townsend Automotive, celebrating 49 years serving West Alabama, has been extending its reach so that you don't even have to be in the Tuscaloosa area to purchase a car from them. Nationwide vehicle delivery service is available for Southern Fork listeners, and it's something that makes buying just the right new or certified pre-owned vehicle even easier. Visit TownsendHonda.com for current inventory. Or, of course, if you're in West Alabama, stop in. Townsend Automotive always salutes local entrepreneurs, from restaurateurs to podcasters, and they welcome you to be part of a community that does the same. Why are historical foodstuffs important? And what might they have to offer to us living now about some of the biggest issues we're facing? Glenn Roberts of Anson Mills and AM Research in Columbia, South Carolina, is on a journey to address those questions through interacting with the foods themselves, finding the seed, growing them out, and working with his team and a host of others around the world to test and apply the results in climates that are rapidly changing. I spoke with Glenn a few years ago, along with Dr. David Shields, about the Carolina Gold Rice Foundation, and many of you will associate Glenn with that iconic southern grain. But he's now applying creative thinking to the companion plants and the ecosystems of the rice, and it's leading him to new questions about salt tolerance, growing cycles, and even which parts of the plant we harvest for food. Now, I'm intellectually flying by the seat of my pants in this conversation, but there's lots of good humor amid the scientific ideas, and Glenn provides us hope for the future of food by looking to the past. Welcome again to the Southern Fork, Glenn Roberts. Well, I'm absolutely thrilled to be in your presence. Well, I am absolutely thrilled to be in yours, so we are we are having that moment, I believe. But um, this is actually a direct request of listeners. We've spoken many times over the years, um, but they wanted an update. They wanted better sound. Yeah, I used to not know how to do any of this, but did it anyway. And um, they wanted to hear what was going on now beyond Carolina Gold Rice. And we've really gone a long way since then. So um, every time I pop into a conversation with you, um, I call you about grain or I ask you a question about who should I speak to here, bread, I get so much information. And today I'd like to start anchoring this conversation by talking about the name of a seed 
the name of a grain that you're working on now. Let's anchor it right there, and then mm -hmm. we can build from there. Okay, so uh, I think the best representation would be sorghum. Sorghum. That is an old, old thing. Right. Um, especially in the South. So um, sorghum was used as a sugar substitute, right, during the pre-colonial all the way to when? Right now. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Yes. That's a, something that people don't think about very often at, at all, that sorghum right. is still very much in use in the U.S., even though we think about it in a small moment of like sorghum syrup put, put on Sean Brock's biscuits or sorghum butter at Rob McDaniel's place in Helen, right? Exactly. So talk about why sorghum is a great place to anchor this. Well, there is life beyond sorghum butter, but it's hard to prove. <laughs> 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 All right. Sorghum is emblematic of everything that we're working on planet-wide. And that just sounds like a dumb broad statement. And in a lot of ways, it may be, but you can go down any rabbit hole. And I must say that in South Carolina, we cheat because in South Carolina, we had have, have the world's foremost number one sorghum researcher, which is Dr. Stephen Kresovich. Um, why do I even bring this up now? Because we all go immediately to what is sweet about sorghum. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering how many people know that sorghum is also a green vegetable. Oh. Well, I mean, I I buy sorghum from Bob's Red Mill, you know, in my mm -hmm. big box grocery store. <clears throat> I like to cook sorghum more so than a quinoa. Yeah. Like, to me, I think it's just got more tooth, like a farro or something like that. So, you know, I get in the mood and I'll buy a bag of sorghum and use it for a few months, you know. But I never thought about it as a green vegetable. Uh, so a fast uh, check on the plant itself, which is where we're living mm -hmm. all the time now. Uh, the Not new anything that we're doing because this is, as we both know, the sun cycle and it's the oldest farming system in the world. So why are we even talking about this? And the answer is every plant has um, catastrophic famine culinary use, something that we don't talk about a whole lot. But when you think about sorghum, no one's making syrup from sorghum and using firewood when they can pull the seed and eat it as a green vegetable. Mm -hmm. But in order to make sorghum syrup, you've got to top the cane at one point because otherwise the seed keeps pulling all the bricks up into the seed. All the energy goes up to the seed head. Right. So uh, of recent uh, discussion, noodling around in, believe it or not, Israel – with my buddy Mitchell Davis on some stuff. Yay, Mitchell. Um, yay, Haven't Mitchell. heard that name in a while. Yay, Mitchell. Yeah, well, he's he's working in Israel. That's why. Uh, and he's not being super vocal about it either. Like the, he was in India and he met a very noted chef. And because I'm old and senile, I don't remember how to pronounce his name because I just found out about this chef two weeks ago, even though I should have known him. I haven't been to his place yet, but I'm going next week. Um, he is looking for sorghum as a green vegetable. Mm -hmm. So it's bright emerald green, looks like green peas. That's the seed when you cut it very, very early. And he cannot find a source in the United States. Isn't that interesting? And he's been looking now for a year. That is interesting. It's interesting for Glenn and I because we nerd out on grain and know that the U.S. is a huge grower of sorghum. Yeah. So to only have it available <clears throat> as a mature seed head used for sugar substitute is a really interesting wrinkle in that food system. It also, Southern Fork listeners, looks like a big, it looks like a sugar cane in a way. It's a, it's a grass. With a little crown on top that's full of seed. Right. Right. Unlike sugar cane, which won't have that. But yeah, you're spot on. And we can be indicted as Anson Mills because we do this as a hobby. We grow all kinds of different sorghums. Due to the work of uh, David Shields and others digging in hard to the antebellum records. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say antebellum, I guess we should take that thing away and say the records before 1850, which we have to admit right off the bat are very patriarchal. 
Right. One of the things this involves, and so here's where Nagoya Protocol, which is where did it come from and who deserves the credit and how does attribution work? In land race culture, we usually don't think that far. If we find something that's really tasty and it's in a seed bank, we just go for it. And we've been doing that for a quarter century at Anson Mills. Right. But what we're required to do with, say, sorghum now is to find out where it came from, who brought it here, why it's here, and who really was doing it. So you're creating stories. You're creating a history of a seed. Right. Of a crop. But the seed in a catastrophic environment, which we have over and over again in the locale of Georgia, Carolina, uh, going back prior to 1800 and forward to now. And what does catastrophic environment mean? It means if you have a field full of sorghum and you've got a hurricane coming, are you going to leave it there? Because it won't be there after the hurricane leaves. Right. right? And that is the saga of everything on the sea islands and coast since first contact and certainly in native communities before then. I think they did a much better job over the Catawba actually taught you know, catastrophic storm management to the settlers. It was nice of them. So we're dealing with this changing climate. Yeah. And we actually are, during your research, finding knowledge of how to deal with it when it comes to sorghum or other crops, right? Exactly. And I'm wondering, the challenge would be, how well have we documented in the literature since uh, African diaspora and maroon culture was not allowed to publish or write? How well have we documented sorghum culture from its inception here? How far back does it go? Uh, and who belongs to it? But more of contemporary concern and to celebrate at the same time, oh, it's not really the end of the world because there's an entire cuisine circulating around the early harvest of crops you would not expect to provide keratin and or chlorophyll and or you just keep naming it all the way through. And the, the mission then becomes, and where we're working now, how many tolerances do these plants have? Sorghum has them all. It's drought, water salt, acid, on and on and on. Mm -hmm. That's what sorghum does. Plus, it's a nematode suppressor in the field, which means it keeps armyworms from coming and eating all your rice. So it's an allied crop in rice, and it's in the sun cycle, which is the oldest farming system known to mankind. And the sun cycle has sorghum as a key element, which is why we ever started growing it. Not for the syrup, but so the rice would be better. So what's happened since the last time you and I discussed things is all of the other crops that we grew, we grew field peas for tilth, which is leguminous, mm -hmm. for eight years before we ever released them as a culinary crop because we had to grow them to do natural tilth rice. So now we actually spend more time on the ancillary crops to support rice horticulture than we do on the rice itself. Right. Okay. Did you follow that? There's I a did. Test later. I did. Okay. I did. Okay. Theoretically. <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah, hilarious. Yeah, makes sense out of that. I Go get ahead. it. No. <laughs> so what you're talking about is growing crops as an as a interconnected ecosystem whose centerpiece is a rice. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then at the beginning of your journey, your your focus was that centerpiece, but now you're looking at all the other pieces of the ecosystem that were part of natural farming knowledge pre-1850, and we've lost that. We have. So I I did follow. You did good. Okay, there and, you go. And I understood what you said. I didn't understand what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm, I haven't ever asked you this question, and um, in quite this way, I feel like a lot of my generation, our generation's work at this time in food is a reclamation of things that are lost. Understanding where food comes from, who it should be attributed to, how to grow it, how to care for the planet while growing it. In a few words, how do we lose it so badly? We tend 
to as a race. It's not just yeah. the U.S. It's you're it's working worldwide. worldwide on this. Right. Well, two facets. That's a, that's a good question. The first one is cultural on the creative side, which is we tend to be aggressively in the quest for new stuff. Uh, we're a user society here in this country. We still are, even though our better sensibilities tell us not to be. Because of that, we have the most food waste of any place in the world. Because um, as you focus on stuff, you leave stuff back. You told and, me that years ago. And right. you taste things and then you go on to the next one. And what you had left over maybe doesn't get used. And so here, here's a key element not to talk about what we do, but to talk about what we do at the same time. We have no waste in our system. We don't sell feed. We feed the habitat because if we don't, they eat our food crops. Uh, and so that becomes another whole exercise in what do the birds want? What does wild hog want? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you keep going, what do the deer want? Because otherwise they're eating your crops. Um, so uh, we do more farming for the habitat than we do for people. And I don't even know that they, they have a word for that. And it's called food plot, food plot husbandry, which is the largest staple acreage of land race presence in the United States. And I don't think anybody knows it. And it's for wild animals. It's not for us. And they have all the good stuff. If you, if you look at the seed they put out for wild animals, you have the sun cycle because it hasn't changed. They wanted to eat the same things we always wanted to eat, right? So if you we grow, are part of the ecosystem, we are just like the deer and the gators and everything else. Right. So the, the very interesting lead of this is if you look at the original plant types with, you know, somebody said the other day, do you have a degree in botany? And I'm going, hell no. You know, it's got a degree in mathematics, topology and. So German lit, useless. Uh, Kleist has not told me anything about how to farm. I did not learn a thing from. But it's it's useful if you ever just need to bring it out at a party. Yeah, I hold up Gunter Grass every time I walk in the field. Right? <laughs> Jesus. So the 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 most important thing to take take away from any of this is no matter what we come up with. And the U.S. government has walked away completely from all the modern breeding techniques. No crisping, no you know gene drive, no advanced hyper GMO, none of that. They're not doing any of that now. They're working with land race stuff that we've been doing this whole time. And land race is the more. I'm sorry, I have to keep interrupting. Right. It's it's a there's a lot of um, there's a lot of vocab in this yeah. in this. Uh, episode mm -hmm. um land race is the correct term instead of heirloom which can get pretty murky pretty yeah, it fast it does because heirloom goes back 50 years essentially why they decided to make that happen i don't know but it happened sometime in the 60s mm -hmm. uh and at that point you were guaranteed to be on pre pretty much pre any crazy mendelian work mm -hmm. but uh, i'll remind us all that the first thing we did with mendel was not listen to anything that was proposed and dwarf the root systems for all our beautiful wheats worldwide. At that point, they started not uptaking full range minerals. And at that point, a century and a half ago, we began the long trek to the hospital with gut disease. Right. Right. So, because if they don't uptake all those minerals, um, then you have to add, um, what is it called? Inputs to make sure that they have some of them. And then, that creates – it tilts the whole system. It's a card. They, um, they bred them so the roots were close to the surface so they could spread nasty chemicals on them because we had way too much gunpowder. We didn't know what to do with it. We said, okay, let's like poison all our fields. You know, that was mm -hmm. the DuPont family. Uh, hello out there. We know who you are. Um, <laughs> now I'm going to get shot. I take that back. No, I also but there am. Were, <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. <laughs> no, there are, I actually know for some, and my mom grew up with them, so I should take all that back. They actually were very, very generous to my mother because she lost everything in the Depression. They took care of her. So I take all of that back, guys, except for one thing. Everybody knows what happened. It's yeah. all in the lid. It's not me. Right. Okay. So the government, to get us back on track, is now focusing on these land race things. They take the stuff from the gene banks, all the different things you can imagine, hundreds of thousands of varieties of things, and they're scanning them all the time for for anything that looks like 
can we get a 32-day corn to dry from the day we put the seed in the ground? Mm-hmm. Where is that in our gene bank? So they send out a bunch of people, and lo and behold, a wonderful guy named Heron Breen, who ran uh, with C.R. Lawn and others at uh, the seed company in Maine that's so famous. Heron uh, always had his stuff on the side, and lo and behold, he has a 38-day maze that you put the seed in the ground, and 38 days later, you've got dry corn. Mm. You just mm-hmm. walk away, and it's drought tolerant, shade tolerant, heat tolerant. It's got all the tolerances. That's how you tell whether these things were around for the last catastrophes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so right now, if you're on the coast and you're thinking rice, what's the tolerance you want? Salt. Who's doing that work? Clemson University. Mm-hmm. Right, right on right South here. Seventeen. We're here. Yeah. yeah. And they've got plenty of salt. We yeah. salted out there a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> all we moved off the coast. We do research on the coast, but we actually don't do production seriously on the coast anywhere in Georgia or the Carolinas anymore because we salt. Yeah. And our rices don't like salt. So we have salt-tolerant rices in these uh, systems that are wicked fast. And my favorite one of all, this guy that's the specialist, is Dr. Travis Huggins at the National Rice Research Center. And he's a colleague of Anna McClung who runs this section of our government still, even though she's not the supreme leader at the National Rice Research Center anymore. She stepped back from that. She's strictly doing her own research. But they have rices that the roots are black all the way to the top of the plant. It's all black because it was meant to be grown at very high altitude so it collects heat. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't freeze to death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And it's wicked fast. So they have all these wonderful things. And then you said one was creative, why why we lost this knowledge and why we're in a period of reclamation. What was the other side of it? The downside of it is the doom and gloom side where we're in a place where we don't have a choice. Given the fact that Mendax under stress, the largest buckwheat producer on the American continents, plural, um, they're out of buckwheat. That's never happened. Um, Depasa is a wonderful sesame Mm -hmm. company. They've had spotty production both in the continental U.S. and in what we call Mexico today. Um, And they're worldwide too. And so if you keep looking at these things, the state of California is 30 points off on rice. I'm going there Monday in order to listen to people figure out what they're going to do. And they have new rices to deal with that supposedly. And for wheats, uh, if you go up and talk to Steve Jones, he's got all kinds of new things that are super fast. So he's at uh, Washington State University, but he runs the bread lab too. Mm -hmm. And that's fun because that's King Arthur right next door. So you get Steve Jones and a bunch of scientists in one lab, and they're they're actually fun. It's kind of like they're having a – I don't know what you'd call it – kind of a rave. (laughs) With food. A bread rave? You go in there. They, yeah, no, not just bread. They'll cook anything. I asked them if they'd cook some soca. They did 20 different versions of soca. And then Steve grabbed into a bag and threw it out on the table like dice. And he had buckwheat in nine different colors from silver all the way to black, pink, red, orange, purple, blue. I've never seen blue buckwheat before, yellow, hmm. gold. I'm going, what's that about? And he said, wouldn't you like to know? I said, yeah. (laughs) Right? So if you're talking about where this is going, all those buckwheats you put on the table, Mm -hmm. 40-day crop. This is a long way from German lit. (laughs) 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 And it's also a long way from cooking. You know, it's a – your brain is – you know, one of the most fascinating things. And I've always said, I enjoy just spending time with you. But I even hesitate to ask this because you're always 15, 20 steps ahead of anything I can ask. But what are, what are you thinking about now? What is making you hungry? Well, I, we were all doing this yesterday, actually. And everybody I mentioned Steve's buckwheat, and I said, uh-huh. is this seed here yet? And everybody just looks at me. I said, have we asked for it? And everybody just looks at me. I said, oh, my God, it's time to plant, and the seed's not here. Who who asked? And it was all silent. I'm going, oh, I was supposed to. <laughs> That's what happens when you get old. So, <laughs> uh, so right now, so yeah. I said that. The first thing right across, I want to have some pink crepes, right? That was mm-hmm. the first thing 
that was said as soon as I said I didn't do my part of it because right. everybody was going, this guy's like losing it, you know. He's supposed to get us to see it. It's not here. And everybody's going, what is he talking about? Right? So pink crepes. Why not? Yeah, that's From pink great. buckwheat. I like it. Yeah, right? or pink pancakes. It'd be like Laffy Taffy meets Bazooka Bubblegum. I love that. I wonder, <laughs> uh, and then, uh, well, we can't even get into the fact that color has flavor. <laughs> Just yes. don't even. We don't? Oh, okay. I mean, we can. We could say briefly. anthocyanin and have a test later too, couldn't we? I can, but I can actually spell that because of Scott Blackwell. <laughs> and the repetition of that uh, that word. <laughs> Volatile aminos. No, never mind. That's right. Okay. That's right. There's a there's going to be a worksheet with this episode. <laughs> um, <laughs> but this is very fascinating. They could turn it in and they get – one pound of 10 things as a reward. There you go. Right? If you... Anybody that can answer whatever questions that Stephanie <laughs> asks at the end gets one pound of the weirdest food they've ever seen in their life. There Promise. You there you go. This is a man who has been inside seed banks all, you know, around the world and also on the back of tractors and also at many, many rental um, car Lots at airports all over the country. Um, so there is one aspect of this thing that is a long way from being a chef tasting a rice and wishing it were not that flavor and going, why is something missing to where you are now? And there is an aspect of what you're doing now and how it's morphed that fits with your personality like a puzzle piece. Um, what is one of those aspects? That's a great question. Honestly, I think the fact that what we have is historically so fungible that every time we try to put our finger on it, the rivulet's like stone in the pond and the rings just keep em emulating out mm -hmm. and you pick up something way across the pond and it's related to the original rock. And you, 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 first you don't know it, and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, and it goes off in your head. That discovery thing um, I was doing as a little kid, even though it was probably started with mud and mm -hmm. my sister throwing it at me. And I said, <laughs> oh, that's mud. That's nice. Um, but the idea was the composition of mud. Then it turned into, can I make synthetic mud? And everybody's going, what's synthetic mud? Are you crazy? I said, mm-hmm. Yeah, but I want I want pretend mud. And yeah. that was before there was pretend mud, which somebody made a billion bucks on that idea. Right. So I also wish there were practical applications for uh, the crazy stuff that we're doing in culinary. Um, that is a lot like a chef just sitting in a closet thinking, okay, what should I do next? Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of where I started with uh, a guy named Julius Herford who was an internationally famous composer and musician. And he taught Leonard Bernstein and the rest of them. Mm -hmm. They all were students, Andre Previn. So that shows you how old I am. Because uh, nobody knew who those people were when they were his students. But Julius said his favorite thing to do was to take a musical score and go in the closet and turn the light off. And I often wondered what the hell that meant. Because I was only six when I heard it. I'm going, what's he talking about? And I asked my mom and dad. They said, he's a very smart man. I said, I didn't ask that. <laughs> what was he saying? And my mother said, you think about it and we'll talk about it tomorrow. And then we never had the discussion. But the idea is now that the ancillary ideas that came out of what we lost in rice culture are applicable across the board. Mm -hmm. Everybody can do it now. Mm -hmm. Citizen science is here. I think the last time we talked, that did not come up. It's the point at which somebody like me that has no formal training whatsoever, can kind of pretend like they're doing something original or helping. Mm -hmm. And I think helping is even a better word. That has changed exponentially in the last five years. This sounds a lot like new math. Uh-huh. It is. <laughs> exactly. It is. And there's so much what you're saying, you know, um, I'm – a big physics person. And so I'm hearing things and I'm going, well, that's a physics concept that you're applying to seed reclamation and seed modification and experimentation, right? Yeah. Well, 
Uh, Velikovsky wrote Worlds in Collision, turned out to be pseudoscience. Mm -hmm. And I was more interested in pseudoscience than I was in the real thing, which kept me open enough to do stuff incredibly dumb that ended up working. And a lot of the people, I remember my hero in the whole world is Anna McClung. She's got postdocs in maize, wheat, and rice. So she's just devastatingly smart. And I can remember her telling me, she said, you know what? It's kind of like you're a mule in the field and you're turning up a gold mine. It's not fair. <laughs> and I, I said, I don't even know what you just said, right? Are you playing a score in the closet, Anna? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but the I'm lucky. Yeah. So far. Yeah. Knock on wood. I'm just listening. hit myself in the head. That's all right. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's strong. It can handle it. Yep. Um, what is one thing keeping you up at night? Quick fire. The, the idea that we're late, late, late. And then the other thing that keeps me up is what we're doing about it and how we can accelerate mm -hmm. the two sides. And you're talking about climate. I'm talking about feeding people because I think you should divorce anything from that. Just take all the concepts away and say, okay, what are we doing to feed people, period. And that means that I can do it, you can do it, John Doe can do it, Sally can do it, whatever. Mm -hmm. I think that we're well past the idea that people can't do this. Right. And I'm a big fan of we need to do a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, at the bottom of the column, I'm, I, I try really hard to run a no waste kitchen. It's amazing how much food you can produce yourself and use it, you know, in different ways in your pantry. I mean, that's also helping in a small way and, mm -hmm. and deal, but that's not going to save. People that are starving. There has to be other things happening at the same time. And I think the biggest problem that we face, and you're not asking me, but I'm using this moment to tell this. Okay. The biggest problem that we face in this issue, um, which is a human issue, a planet issue, is that we are dualistic thinkers who think if I have a reason and this is how we're going to do it, this is the only way to do it. And everybody else is, no. So we're only going to put the money there. Oh, so you, you're very well experienced in the peer review system. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. And advanced degrees. Yes, I have, is my thesis. Yeah, I have a few. Mostly in my field, it wasn't ever anyone's thesis except for native people uh -huh. and the oldest citizens on the earth in Africa and China mm -hmm. in my field. So I'm so far out of it, I don't even qualify. Right. So I give everything away. Our largest asset is seed. The, we got tons of stuff going on, but still the biggest asset we have is seed and it's all free. Love it. So if you need seed, call me, write me, whatever. I got seed. There'll be links on the southernfork.com. <laughs> and he means it. Honestly, I've been around and he just hands out packets or mails them to you or um, totes if you're qualified. Yeah. That's tons. At you a don't time. need if you're a qualified. Tote. <laughs> Well, if you're growing a lot of stuff, maybe you do. That's true. I'm, I have some people listening. Okay. So, um, all right. This is a wonderful question that I didn't get to ask you at last time we were together because I, I wasn't at that point in the podcast. Um, and it's something that I reserve just for Southern Fork listeners. It is my magic picnic basket. So I used to ask about a death row meal and then I realized I don't believe in the death row. So I don't want to ask that. I actually want to bring you some food that brings you life. So in this and with this magic picnic basket, I can time travel. I can go back and ask anybody to make one more bite of something that we, you would love to have again or love to try for the first time. I can cook a little bit and I can source. Um, but I don't have the international access that you do. So uh, give me a break on that. If you yeah. need to bring something specific, just get that yourself. But I would love to put you some of your favorite foods in the basket. They don't have to go together. Um, and people just love to know other culinary folks through what they like. So what do you like? What can I put in there for you? Number one, green oats. So green oatmeal or green porridge. That's oats you can see through that are little emeralds, whole grain. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't have that. A vena verde, which most people interpret as powder, which is made from the leaves of the oat plant, not from the grain itself. That would be first. So all of these are quick 
out of the field because you have to get them out of the field. Um, and with that, the leaves of almost every staple plant out there in the salad. Because at one point or another, every staple plant has edible vegetable quality. Even rice leaves, if you roast them and then grind them, you can use them as a flour to make crepes. And mm-hmm. there you, but if you put your hand on it wrong, it'll, it'll bleed. Right. 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 Um, Cause it's a palmetto kind of razor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, I'm fascinated with all the things you could make from bamboo as a young plant and all the things you can make from any cane as a young plant. Um, so I would love to be able to have, uh, bamboo biscuit. A bamboo A southern biscuit. biscuit made with bamboo seed because bamboo is perennial, invasive, and was everywhere. We went through a whole phase of bamboo. There's still wild stands of bamboo all over the South, as we both know. Right. Right? That bamboo actually makes some incredible flour that makes incredible biscuits. Hmm. Tinder. Yeah. Hmm. I don't even know if I could identify a bamboo seed. They tiny? look a little bit like tiny sunflower seeds. Oh, Okay. And they're bright green. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we have biscuits and crepes mm-hmm. and some oatmeal. Okay. Definitely. Okay. Okay. More? I mean, do you need a beverage? That's what I was going to ask. Do you like a, want a beverage? <laughs> and if I were going to You're do- You're going all carb and green <laughs> vegetable salads. <laughs> okay. For a beverage, that's a tough one because generally people think that native people did not distill. But I have done it myself, so I know they did. They they had clay, so they couldn't boil stuff. But they also had rocks. And if you can you can build a still with rocks. And I've actually done it in Arizona in the summer and made little drips of whiskey. So I would like a ferment of something made native fashion from a clay pot that has stuff in it. It's just evaporating stuff that's below boiling. So it never boils. And then there's a cold rock over it to condense it. Mm -hmm. And you have a little cup or a leaf or whatever you collect that on. And that's your beverage. I'm going to have to take some classes in order to get this basket together for her. (laughs) (laughs) No, just go live with Ramona uh, and her daughter uh, and Terry Button. Ramona Button and Terry Button. And with the Navajo, and she'll show you exactly how to do that. Okay. I, yeah, that, that works for me. Anything, yeah, that would be cool. Anything. I mean, You know, I great. think Arizona is still part of the South, but no one else agrees with me. I don't agree with you. Well, who was supplying all that wonderful biscuit flour to the Confederacy? No, that's a good point. The Navajo Nation. <sighs> for pretty good prices. That is Unfortunately, a- they were being forced to do it. Yeah. That is a whole nother podcast, Glenn Roberts. There you go. Well, if people want to learn more about Glenn Roberts, Anson Mills, and the other aspect of your business, which is called AM Research. Thank you. You can go to the southernfork.com. I'm going to have links there as well as images so you can see the face behind the voice. If you like what you hear, I love the opportunity to spend time with people that inspire me and Mr. Roberts, you have inspired me throughout my culinary journey, and you help feed me often from the bags of all kinds of grains in my freezer. So thank you. Thank you so much for taking time with me today per listener request. That's uh, feelings mutual for sure, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Hello, and welcome to Talking With My Mouthful. I um, was really pinged in part of this conversation when Glenn was talking about feeding the animals so that they did not eat crops. And I think about this every year when I hear friends and family members talking about fighting with the squirrels for tomatoes in their vegetable garden. You know, I sit here in a suburban little apartment and I am surrounded by squirrels and songbirds and lizards and all kinds of skinks this time. I mean, I don't even know if they're skinks, but I think so. Uh, This time of year, sunning themselves on my brick steps at the front stoop. And I think about the fact that I'm sitting here too. And sometimes I'm just separated by a pane of glass or just a few feet from this 
kind of living, breathing ecosystem that I'm in the middle of. I think we forget about that. And, you know, I like to think about food being cooked by people that want to cook for me and want to care about the food that they're cooking. And I think that that makes it taste better or it's a better overall experience for me. I wonder if gardening could feel that way if you decide not to wage war against the squirrels for your tomatoes, but you decide to, you know, set some peanuts over to the side. They love peanuts, by the way. And um, not next to your tomatoes, <laughs> but maybe in a different area. And they can just eat as many as they want. Maybe they'll be less interested in your tomatoes. But, you know, I am nonviolent. And so I think that putting down the battle flag of fighting animals for your vegetable garden feels good to me. Maybe um, this year we we decide not to fight that battle (laughs) and we give them some peanuts and see how many more tomatoes, especially those Cherokee purple ones I know you're growing, how many more tomatoes you can get for your summer table. So anyway, Just a quick thought, I know we were talking about a lot of really heady research today, but sometimes it does come back down to your own backyard. Thanks so much for listening, and I will be right here with you next week. You've been listening to The Southern Fork. I can't wait to bring you more culinary conversations. But in the meantime, I have one question. Are you going to eat all that? <laughs>